Welcome to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. The 2012 election is behind us. It's been a couple of weeks and we are now looking at the results with Jerome Horton. He is the chair of California's Board of Equalization. And I think it's fair to say, sir, that the Democratic Party, both in California and nationally, had quite a day on November 6. Would you agree? Quite a day, Brad. I mean, in fact, we had a fabulous day. I mean, we won on a number of different issues and uh, we're so proud of the president taking that. But here in California, the Democratic Party took almost two thirds of the assembly. Uh, it could be two thirds two, for sure. Two thirds of the Senate as well, right. you know, uh, at least the numbers look that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's exciting. I want to talk to you about Proposition 30. Yes. Which was the governor's tax initiative, given that you are a tax <laughs> official yeah. in the state of California. Quarter percent increase in sales tax. Right, let's talk about that. I got to tell you, I didn't think Prop 30 would pass. Uh, and what Prop 30 does is it increases sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, increases taxes on the wealthy for seven years, but it passed pretty handily, 54%. Yes. Yes. What do you think happened? Why did it pass in the end? It was polling below 50. Well, I think, Brad, what happened was is people were given a choice between 30 and 38. 38 said, I'm going to tax everyone from whether from the homeless right. uh, to the richest and so forth. And they and said, well, we, we don't want to be taxed. Right. And, and 38 they voted got against slaughtered. It. Slaughtered. Absolutely yeah. slaughtered. So instead of voting for 38, they voted for 30. And quite, quite naturally, if you look at the elections throughout the last 10 years, when you're attempting to raise funds for education. People are very supportive of education. They are, but think about it. In June, a cigarette tax failed in California. Yes. You know, not Kentucky, not North Carolina. In California, a cigarette tax failed. But the and billions yet, of dollars spent on the cigarette tax, and cigarette tax is something everyone that smokes in California, uh, you know, they, they voted against it. Sure, that's, that's, but that's still, yeah. also a big victory for labor, Democratic side would be the no side on Prop 32, which arguably would have prevented corporations and unions from contributing to campaigns. But many editorial boards uh, said that really the initiative was one sided <laughs> against the unions. Well, that, that initiative targeted working families. It sought to prohibit working families from organizing, working together to protect themselves. And I think that was a message that California, that resonated in California, and that's why I went down and defeat. I want to talk more about Prop 30 if we may because sure. as we mentioned you are the yeah, tax official course, yeah. um, chief tax official I guess you could say I don't know if that's Something a badge like of honor that. <laughs> you know, but um, what should Californians be doing to prepare if anything well, I think, there are, I think there are a number of things that we can do. But first, we, Brad, I think we've got to realize, even though Prop 30 said the sales tax went up a quarter percent, we also had sales tax increases in various different cities and counties. That's true. Culver and City, for Culver example. Culver City, for example. Right. So now, many of these cities could have upward 11% tax, 11% mm -hmm. sales tax. So, you know, people are going to have to make decisions whether or not they want to uh, adjust their right. uh, the way of living. Do you decrease the amount of items that you're buying? Do you now eat your food in, in Santa right. Monica well, oh. versus Beverly Hills because there's a lower sales right. tax? Or do you cook at home? Let's talk to about those the sales tax. that are the wealthy. Yes. If you make $250,000 or more, right. your income taxes will increase. Right. And I understand that the increase is for tax year 2012, even though it, the tax increase passed it's, in November. It's retroactive. It's retroactive. Right. It's retroactive. The challenge here for those that are making $250,000 or more, they're going to have to look at ways of deferring their income tax mm. or look at ways of increasing their deduction. A number, right. of, for example, if you're planning on getting married, Brad, I suggest you do it before January 1st. Right. You know, so you can I, take that marriage deduction. Right, right. Uh, if you're if you're planning on making a charitable do donation, do it now. It, do it now. Do it right away. Do it now. And of course, there's tax planning, deferring your income through tax planning, now, a number of other if ways. If Prop 30 had not passed, yes, what would have happened? You know, Br Brad, I tell you, I don't know that Prop 30 is going to make that big of a difference. Really? Because those who are making $250,000 or more, they're going to really spend some serious time at tax planning. And they're going to reduce their taxable income but the by deferring cent, their income. The quarter cent. The quarter cent's going to hit us all. We're mm -hmm. all going to pay an additional quarter percent. I, I mean, as I understand it, about $6 billion would have evaporated from 
K-12, K-14, UCCSU. It would have. And we needed the money for education. Uh, the question now is how do we govern? It's not enough, Brad. We're still going to be faced with 15, 20 deficits. billion dollar deficits. So there are still some, some strategies that have to be employed. So it's a governing issue, now, what, especially with two-thirds Democrats, right. two-thirds Republicans. Yes. If we, we do have a two-thirds majority in both the Senate and the Assembly, which it looks like we may, yes. uh, we those bodies can pass taxes with a two-thirds Thirds vote. Well, not have, only taxes, fees, right? Uh, close the loopholes, change the regulations. But I got to tell you, be very challenging. Yeah, I got to tell you though. If I look at, for example, the California State Senate, yes. I mean, this, yeah, the Democrats in there, I think it's fair to say, are pretty moderate. I mean, I don't, I don't well, know. Well, I'm just I, an observer. I think they're pretty thoughtful. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I served in the le legislature in the assembly, we were a little emotional. You know, <laughs> and so we the wanted the raucous caucus. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so, but by the time we got to the Senate. We had to have it together because they were extremely thoughtful, analytical, right. methodical in their thinking. And so maybe it's still the same. But what the Republicans were saying in this cycle is don't let the Democrats get two thirds. They will run up your tax bill. Apparently, the voters disagreed. Right. But as a Democrat yourself and a moderate Democrat, as I understand it, do you see a, a sudden flurry of taxes coming our way out of the well, legislature? Well, I'm also liberal on social issues. So mm -hmm. I believe that, and, and try to be strategic as when it relates to taxation, I believe we ought to broaden the tax base, right. increase the number of people who are employed in California, mm -hmm. so that everyone is sort of contributing to the challenges that we face in California. Raising taxes, certainly there's there's a need for that, but we need to be more efficient about what we about do. It. There has to be strategic and smart about the tax and, loopholes. And what about Prop 39? That passed, yeah. and that closes a loophole that benefited out-of-state corporations. Exactly. How will that help the state? Well, I think it would add another somewhere around a, another billion dollars to the revenue well, if, nice. in fact, it doesn't modify behavior because it very well could mm -hmm. modify behavior and you can find businesses leaving California or, you know, there are a number of businesses who supported it. There are a number of businesses in California who opposed it. How will they react as a result of that? I want to talk to you about the demographics of this election. Interesting. Uh, very interesting. interesting. If you look at the national vote, uh, President Obama got about 40 percent of the white vote. The African-American vote, over 90 percent. The Asian, Hispanic, Jewish vote over 70%. Mm -hmm. Those are huge margins. Gave him his margin for victory. And if you look at the trends, the demography is not looking very positive if you're a Republican. What are you saying? Well, you know, Brad, if you look at if you look at George Bush's race, we had similar demography, uh, except it was a little higher on on the, on the, the white vote. Mm -hmm. However, similar. What drove George Bush was fear. And so I believe that the American people were afraid of Mitt Romney. They were afraid of what might happen if we mm -hmm. elected this guy. And so there was that fear of social issues, economic issues. I mean, the reality is we had some economic challenges. But we prefer President Obama to address those because he's more kin to our th way of thinking. But what about the underlying issue? We'll take President Obama out of the equation for now, even yes. though he hi yes. is really a, a quite a transformative figure. You look at the landscape, and I look at 2016, I look at 2020, mm -hmm. I don't see how the Republicans can cobble together a coalition. And there's social issues. Right. They have a chance of Do getting back in the game. Do you think that if the Democratic Party's uh, nominee is not African American, which yes. it may not be in 2016, right. could that start to spell a recipe for more African Americans looking at the Republican Party? Or no, no. I think I think the minorities are driven on social issues, socioeconomic issues, and it's a function of trust. They have to trust you. I mean, you got to keep in mind uh, these. These are individuals that have been oppressed for the, the majority of the time mm -hmm. that they've been here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so that fear factor, that trust factor is extremely important to all of those ethnic groups. And so okay. in, in the next presidential election, I think it'll be about the issues. And I believe President Obama will will resolve many of the issues that are right. in front of us today. Okay, his name is Jerome yes. Horton. He <laughs> is the chair of the California Board of Equalization. We'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, King Alexander, he is the president of Cal State Long Beach. And sir, I have to be completely honest with you. When I asked your office to come on our show, I was sure I was going to be speaking with you about the defeat of Proposition 30, the governor's tax initiative to increase sales tax by a quarter cent and increase taxes on the wealthy. Boy, I was wrong. 5446. What happened? Well, I, th I think. Uh I, I want to commend our students. I think many, many more students. We may have had our largest turnout uh, in the last two elections, but this may have been the largest turnout of our student population. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly helped. Uh, I noticed in some areas uh, many of uh, those that would oppose this type of initiative didn't vote. So I think the combination of those two things propelled it uh, to a very positive finish, a strong finish. Please be honest with me. No one else is listening. What did you think was going to happen? Well, I, I thought, I, <laughs> no one else is listening. I thought we'd come in about 48 and a half percent. I was really hedging on the pollsters. I knew 38 was, was yes, that wasn't was, going to happen. Wasn't going to happen. Um, and I was just wondering and hoping that we could get enough students out, uh, get enough students to vote, and and they did. And I think you're seeing the result of that. And what's interesting about Prop 38, which would have taxed everyone. Uh, income tax, that spent no money on higher education. It was just a K-12 initiative. That was our challenge. Um, right. We're not against, uh, we were actually for, we know the schools are in such horrific shape financially in this state and higher education's moving right in that same direction, yes. just a little bit above them. Uh, so we want to do everything we can to help our schools. Uh, the, the only proposition that helped us both Right. Which as a system and a great college promise that we have here in Long Beach where education starts in preschool and finishes as a doctoral student here, mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure that, that, that we're not vying against each other and we're supporting each other throughout the process. So now that Prop 30 has passed, what happens at the Cal State system? Or another way, what doesn't happen? Well, uh, let me first point out that this doesn't restore any funding for higher education. It does help our schools out somewhat, uh, it, but it, I see it as a good first step. The people of California ha have have shown and indicated that they are also concerned about the nature of where public education is going and how far down we've we've been pushed. And oh, and it's the lack of investment. way down. It, yeah. it is remarkable. I mean, our tuition increases over the last few years at Cal State and UC have outpaced inflation, have been the highest in the nation. In fact, Cal State had passed a tuition increase for this year. It was rescinded, right. waiting for the result of Prop 30. Exactly. Now that rescission is in place. Right, and so our students will get a check or a rebate. We're still working out the details of uh, that, of 249 for this semester, and they will take that off next uh, semester's tuition bill. However, the, the whole increase, the tuition increase issue is, is directly related to a 33% budget reduction on the part of the state. And we've told them if they fund the students and they fund our students' education, we will not raise it a dime. But when they take money away and they stop funding our students, we have no recourse but to raise tuition. Now, part of the challenge is while the UC system's tuition is on the higher end of public schools, the CSU system is not Correct. compared to the national average. And so I wonder if that puts a continued target on the back of the CSU system because it still is a very good deal, relatively speaking, and it's not as if the CSU system is a stepchild anymore. I mean, oh, yeah. Cal State Long Beach, Cal Poly Pomona, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, these are seen as fine institutions, desirable institutions. Yeah, in fact, we were second in the country in number of applications this fall with 78,000. Behind Harvard. Harvard. Uh, well, actually behind UCLA. Oh, so there you have it. Yeah, Harvard, so Harvard's below you. Harvard has about 30,000. Cornell, I think, broke their record of about 32,000, to put Se that in perspective. 78,000. 78,000 applications. Right. So it, it is a, it, we are, we do charge about $2,500 below the national average. We have the least amount of student indebtedness in the country, but we're not immune from all the criticism of higher education. When schools like Sarah Lawrence University charge $61,000 yes. this fall, and student loan debt hits a trillion dollars. We all kind of get brushed with the stroke that we're all misbehaving in this, in this way, but that's not the case. It's interesting you mentioned student debt because student debt has been soaring, but recently a study came out that ranked California 47th in the amount owed by college grads, and it's good to be at the bottom. It's certainly good to be at the bottom. In that one. So again, it begs the question, when California student debt is low, 
<laughs> it creates that target on the back. Oh, look, yeah. you, you know, you're not that high in tuition compared to your colleagues, your, your counterparts. Student debt is low. We're ranked in every value ranking as one of the best values in America. But we, once again, when parents read about higher education or see something about higher education, generally it's on the extreme end of things. So we all get painted with these brush strokes that we're all uh, inefficient, we're all overcharging, and we don't care about students going into debt which is the opposite of what we do, because we actually are one of the most efficient systems in America. We charge among the lowest in America, and we have the least amount of student debt. I do want to ask you about a controversial letter that was issued before the election. I know it had nothing to do with you, yeah. but that letter was a letter to all applicants that indicated that if Prop 30 did not pass, that uh, the number of admittees would go down. Correct. I'm not asking you to comment on the letter, but what kind of brushback, if any, did you get? We got a little bit. Uh, I think the Jarvis groups uh, wanted. There was many groups that just wanted us to shut up and not talk about mm. the realities and the facts of what will happen if it passes versus if it doesn't. And our superintendent here of public schools and our uh, community college president, city college president, we've been on sort of a circuit telling people, informing people. Because one of the big problems I've noticed in California in the last seven years, we have a lot of propositions that people don't know anything about. What's interesting is I think this is the first time I have seen college presidents having to go out and politic in a certain sense. That has yeah. not been the history of California. But I will say this. I think Governor Brown was very clear with the voters that if Prop 30 did not pass, X, Y, and Z would happen. Correct. Six billion dollars of cuts into education. And a lot of people were saying if it doesn't pass, California, you got what you asked for. Well, and, and that's what we were telling people. If, if it doesn't pass, this w is what is going to happen on our campus. We will cut 2,000 classes, 200 teaching jobs. We will not allow 2,500 to 3,000 new students to attend our institution. Yeah, and let's talk about admissions because mm -hmm. I know the Cal State system had put admissions on hold correct. until the results of Prop 30 came in. On hold. Everyone was waitlisted, essentially. Everyone, correct. So now that it's passed, what happens? Do we see admission at a stable level from last year? Do you take more or less? Where do you go? Well, uh, we have a certain deadline on applications, and uh, what we'll do is start analyzing those applicants then. By the time we get to uh, decisions on admissions, mm -hmm. we'll have a better idea of what the January budget will be because really we're talking about the next year's starting July 1 budget. That will determine how many new students we'll be able to take in the fall of next year. But aren't you admitting before then? We're, we're closed in January. Um, we're not allowing only a few institutions in the Central Valley oh, are right. admitting transfer students. But we're not. What about for the fall, though? For, for those that are applying for next fall, when do they find out if they're admitted? Early spring. So, so you'll know by then how many you can admit? We'll know by then because we'll have a pretty good idea what the budget may not be passed, but we'll have a pretty good idea of what that budget may look like. But it is remarkable that what you just described is a virtual halt on all mid-year admissions. Well, normally we admit in the early spring, and we do we because we really don't move until December and January on many of this, on, on much of this. Um, we're in the process of collecting all of these now. Right. And then we'll start making decisions about late December and into January and February. We'll know a lot more as January progresses. I do want to ask you about the new, I guess it's Chancellor. I get confused with the title. Yeah, the new yeah, Chancellor, Chancellor of the Cal State it's System. Chancellor. Chancellor. At the UC system, it would be president. His name is Tim White. Right. He comes from UC Riverside where he was Chancellor there, yeah. different titles. Uh, as you look towards new leadership of the Cal State system, what are your thoughts? Well, I think Tim will do a fantastic job. Uh, I've worked with him in the Big West Conference, Athletic Conference, mm. our Division I Athletic Conference very closely, and he's done a, we've, we've been working together closely for three years in that conference. Um, it, we are faced with a very challenged system because of how, how our limited resources. You mentioned that we're well below the national average in what we charge. Well, we're also well below the national average in how we're funded by the state. I, that's true. So the combination of both of those puts a lot of pressure. In addition to that, we have nearly 50% of our population are among the lowest income students in America. Right. So all of that puts tremendous strain on this system. Okay. And that's what we have to work together to achieve. His name is King Alexander. He is the president of Cal State Long Beach. I'm Brad Palmer, and this is California Edition.
It's California edition. I'm Brad Palmer and I'm glad you're with us today. We are joined by Erica Hunter. You have seen her on Broadway on The Lion King, Flower Drum Song, 42nd Street, and most recently Rock of Ages, which she plays in kind of on and off. You were running through Rock of Ages for three years straight and now you kind of go back and forth. Yeah, I um, joined the cast when it moved to Broadway from off Broadway. Right. So I'm original Broadway cast, which is a really special experience opening a show on Broadway. And I stayed with it for three years, right. leaving recently um, about 11 months ago. Fair enough. And now I kind of have this great gig where if they need me, I come in for a week at a time every couple months. It's it's pretty great. And when you co go back, you play different parts because you know the entire show so well. I know everything. Yeah, I play my old role, which is waitress number one. Uh -huh. Every once in a while, I play um, Sherry, which is the lead role. So from waitress number one to the lead. Yes, exactly. <laughs> which is crazy. Well, it's funny because waitress number one is one of just three girls, and she's actually the most prominent of the three ensemble girls. It's like Little Shop of Horrors, the three... You, exactly. You know what exactly. I'm saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned Waitress Number One and uh, the role of Sherry, because in both instances, you need to put on a blonde wig. Yes. And that plays into the purpose of our discussion today, which is bullying. And in the context of Erica Hunter, it's bullying that often was as a result of ethnicity. Yes. So why don't you talk to us about your family's background, which is wonderfully diverse and wonderfully rich in culture, but can present challenges or has presented challenges for you as a child? Yeah, um, you know, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada. What is it with all these Canadians? <laughs> they're everywhere. Well, we're trying to I, get here. I was gonna say. Um, I grew up in Ottawa. It's it's the capital of Canada, but right. it's really small. It it's is. like a, it's, it's not Toronto. It's a real like you know small, great place to grow up. I right. have to say, it's a beautiful place to grow up, and it is quite diverse. Right. Um, my father is originally from China. He was born in Shanghai. So he's not Chinese North American. He's Chinese. He's Chinese, mm -hmm. and he came to Canada for college, mm -hmm. where he met my mother, who's Dutch, German, and English. Grew right. up on a farm. European. Just, European. Mm -hmm. Grew up just outside of Ottawa. Farm girl. I got it. Totally different got the backgrounds. Picture. Got the picture. Got married, had some babies. Right. I'm, and I'm and the you're second. the offspring. Yes. <laughs> so you are Eurasian, you are yes. biracial. Mm -hmm. And even though America, North America, is ethically diverse, you know, it, it can present certain challenges for children. Because when all of a sudden this Chinese man picks you up from school, I mean, if I looked at you, I, I don't know that I would realize you're, you're Eurasian. I mean, Maybe Latina, maybe who knows? It maybe you just got anything. great eyes. <laughs> yeah, you know, who knows? Right. And so talk to us about how those experiences shaped you and how you're trying to use uh, what you learned growing up to the benefit of others. Well, I think like you said about being picked up from school, you know, my father is clearly Chinese. My mother is blonde hair, green eyes, right. which I don't look anything like. Sure. I am definitely a mix of the two of them, but you know, kids would say, is that really your mom? Right. Are you adopted? Is that really your dad? And then I would start questioning that. And and I would have lots of instances where I would want to wake up in the morning and have blonde hair and green right. eyes or blue eyes. And, and I didn't really understand, you know, my look as compared to how I felt. You know, I just felt like a normal girl. And then people had their opinions about it. it. What's interesting is today, you know, I will often see the breakdowns. And a lot of breakdowns call for, and this is the term I see, ethnically ambiguous. Right. You see that, and I guess that's arguably to your advantage because, again, on face value, hard to know. Exactly. Hard and, to know. and I have to say, with the business I chose to get mm -hmm. into, entertainment, um, it, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes, you know, my first Broadway show was Flower Drum Song, entirely Asian right. cast. Were you Asian enough? I guess I was to get cast, but then you know, at the stage but door, I would get I would get ridiculed a little bit. Like, did they extenuate your eyes? A little bit. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it just depends where you are, you know, and what. I was also in The Lion King, and in The Lion King, people were like, "Oh, there's that Chinese girl," right. you know. So it's just, it's other people's opinions, and that's fine. And once you really become confident in right. how you look and how you feel. More importantly, then you can carry on, and then you don't—they don't get inside. Sure, your head. and it's—it's it's nice that you came out as an uh, advocate <laughs> of anti-bullying on a website called Bullyville. Yeah. 
um, which says a lot. I mean, you could have just been silent and it didn't really matter, but you chose to tell your story, uh, to try to let people know um, that it's okay and bullying's not acceptable and I'm here for you. Right, I think a lot of people who are bullied feel very alone. They feel alienated, they wonder why me, why is this happening? Bullyville is an amazing place because you realize that more people are bullied than there are bullies. Right. And then you come united, you know, and then you feel like you're more of a team, like you're part of something. And and it's true, like strength comes in numbers. And the power is within you to, you know, express that, but I have to ask you, and I know you're Canadian, I know you're not a, into politics, but I do <laughs> want to ask you about the recent presidential election because we have re-elected a man who is biracial. His mother was white, his father was black. What does that say to you? Maybe it says nothing, but maybe it does speak to you. It does speak to me. I think, you know, I feel really gift, uh, blessed, you know, right. that I can have these two mm. very distinct cultures in my life and that my parents instilled all of that in me. You know, I think it's probably the same for our president. Mm -hmm. You know, he is a product of his environment. Right. And because of that, he went on to do great things. And it's interesting, I don't know if you know this, you probably don't, but in America we have to fill out a census form every 10 years and on that census form you're asked for your racial makeup. And he marked African American. And there is all this, you know, brouhaha about, well wait a sec, what about his European heritage? And so we kind of get put into these boxes. Uh, but, you it's know. interesting because it's yeah. kind of the same thing we do. You know, when right. I was first starting out my career, you go to these big cattle calls right. for these Broadway shows, and our union oh, right. will send us a sheet. You know, you fill out your name, and everything, and then it will say, check a box. So what do you do? What did you do? Uh, sometimes, I oh, depends what I was auditioning yeah, for. Yeah, no, which is absolutely understandable. <laughs> you know, I would check, sometimes I would check Caucasian, sometimes Asian, sometimes both. Uh -huh. um, it really depended on what, what I was going out for. So have you spoken with young girls, young boys that happen to be biracial? I mean, are you really getting a sense of their kind of hopes and fears? Because... Yeah, it's a very interesting thing mm -hmm. because I have three young nieces. Mm -hmm. My sister is, you know, the same makeup as right. I am. Her husband's Indian. Ah. So they're even more, you know, mixed together than I am. I trust that they're stunning. They're I mean, beautiful. that's one thing about <laughs> multi ethnic children, if I may say. I'm making a generalization, but there is a lot of beauty in the mixture. I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, I love, like, even with music, I collaborate with other people. Mm -hmm. I think when you bring more things into the pot, the more exciting so it can be. So I know that your niece, is it nieces, nephews? Yeah, my, I have three nieces. Three nieces, okay. Mm -hmm. They're young, but uh, you know, do, do, well, are they sent, do they sense their kind of the beauty of the biracial, triracial nature of themselves? I don't, I don't think they've quite realized how gorgeous they are. <laughs> um, Ethnicity aside. I don't think they right. have, but I see my sister and her husband really trying to fit all of it in there, you know, well, that's a, give that's them all of their Indian culture, right. all of their Chinese culture, all the Canadian yeah, European culture. Of course. You know, I see them trying to get it in there and it is difficult, you know. I know my father wanted me to go to Chinese school when I was Do you speak younger. Mandarin or Chinese? My dad speaks Mandarin and Cantonese. Okay. I speak a little bit of Mandarin, not very much. Okay, well hopefully you'll learn. What's next for Erica Hunter? Professionally, if I may ask. Professionally, I'm diving into the music world. Re meaning recording artists? Recording artists, Broadway yes. type or pop type or? Dance pop type. Really? I've, next Paula Abdul? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I started dancing. Dancing was my right. first love. And it was like Madonna, oh, Kylie Minogue, oh. like, you know, these like pop queens, sure. icons. And uh, and I started venturing into that that lane and right. I absolutely love it. Well, best of luck. Her name is Erica Hunter. You can read her story on Bullyville.com and I'm sure we can see you on Broadway, somewhere on the stage television movies. My name is Brad Pomerantz. This is California Edition.